Nvidia just delivered a blockbuster earnings leading to the stock going up after hours, but has it cancelled the sell that we tend to see in election years between February and March? And more importantly, what levels next for this most important stock as it approaches close to all-time highs after the earnings announcement? Will the core wall be too big for it? And what about Amazon's inclusion in the Dow as Jeff Bezos sells $1 billion in stock per day? What are the stats leading from that? That along with our thoughts on the S&P 500 holding the 20 moving average, the Qs holding the zone, and the VIX unable to get through that Volmageddon level of 16 for the third time. This is all coming up in today's show as we cover stocks, commodities, and cryptos around the world together. Well, welcome back, everyone, to one of the largest daily shows on the internet where we talk about markets together. My name's Tom, and we've got some big macro and data coming your way along with key levels. But of course, the last 24 hours was about two things, the FOMC meeting minutes and, of course, NVIDIA. And while NVIDIA dropped around 9% in recent days of trade, it added on between 7 and 8% in after hours as it gave us a big result that really met those 10 out of 10 standards that everybody needed to see. So what next for the stock? We'll cover that a little bit later on. But just a quick reminder, make sure to sign up for our VIP free weekly newsletter. Links in the description down below. It's as easy as literally putting in your name and email address. So let's get things started by discussing the FOMC meeting minutes. Of course, we saw some big yield changes, which continue to show less rate cuts coming through over the next 12 months. But we also saw the Fed's reverse repos race towards zero. And we'll be tracking that a little bit later on and discussing it along with another one of the big indicators that a lot of us watch, which is, of course, the Fed's balance sheet. That continues to drop, and a lot of people would think, well, because it's dropping, the market has to go down, right? Well, it's a little bit more complex than that, and of course, we do have a tracking mechanism, which we'll talk about later on the show, that dropped a little bit over the last 24 hours, so stay tuned for that. Let's go through NVIDIA's earnings. Of course, it was good on the surface, but as always with shares, it's going to be about Ford earnings and Ford sales gains. And NVIDIA predicted another massive sales gain for the current quarter, which is helping justify the stock rally and has, of course, turned it into the third largest company in the world, in, well, in terms of the American market at this stage. What I thought was really surprising is throughout the session, you were seeing peak FOMO. In fact, one of the biggest trade strikes was a $1,300 contract that was probably being traded by some of you out there on the internet and uh, that was certainly some YOLO action to get a doubling effect. It didn't quite happen, but uh, I can see that people are FOMOing. And it's showing you that the market is in a bit of euphoria, which we, we can also see based on the options going through on the markets right now. Speaking of options, the market didn't quite sell heavily enough in the last 24 hours, regardless of NVIDIA's earnings. And a lot of that has to do with these two strikes here. Notice the sea of red on both of the left-hand sides. Of course, NVIDIA was one of the most anticipated earnings results, rightfully so. It's really what's driven this rally. And it looked like puts were being struck off on the zero DTEs. Now, if we take a look at expirations moving forward, you might notice there's not as much protection in the market to the downside. So maybe it will hold or even just sell a little bit on Thursday, but it doesn't seem like there's much protection leading into a point of seasonal weakness in markets, regardless of NVIDIA's result. And of course, we will need to look at the price action standpoint and some key levels coming up later on as well. When we take a look at the S&P 500 profile at this point in view, you can see here the 5K, everything else like that level, very, very solidified with a ton of puts, and that's helping to protect that position at this stage. So let's talk about the FOMC here for a minute because we know that the Fed is saying something. The markets are saying, yeah, we don't quite believe you. And we are seeing a huge change in the funds rate at this stage in terms of it's rallied back about 50% of what it was dropping. Yet the S&P 500 is completely decoupled from this event. And you know what? Bonds haven't. Bonds are moving in that direction. So effectively, we've got bonds agreeing with the overall movement in markets to a degree. We've got the stock market saying, yeah, we don't care. Everything's all great. And this disconnection is just relatively recent. In fact, it only just started to occur in 2024. For most of 2022 and 23, we've been very well connected to yields. One that's worth checking out, it's over on our X account in the links in the description down below. So NVIDIA didn't present a big sell-off. It presented pretty much in line with what most people thought, which was an absolute blockbuster, and it did rally up. It wasn't quite like SMCI and PanW as well 
getting absolutely destroyed over the last 24 hours, dropping well over 20% for the stock. Now, these particular stocks are unlikely to make new all-time highs or at least hold new all-time highs anytime soon. And I put the two scenarios that I think are most likely for these stocks because we will be following SMCI for a while here on the channel as it's a very good case scenario for all of us to learn from and to see how it ends up trading. That was a bit of euphoria and Pan W has probably also come into <laughs> the overall type of trade. Let's talk about stock net call volume because it's euphoric and it's clear that we are seeing a huge amount of calls put in the system, which always feels the same way and always brings in the FOMO. Now, if NVIDIA didn't convince you there's a bit of FOMO with $1,300 calls coming in, <laughs> then nothing probably will. But could it get worse before it gets better? Well, the answer is quite simply yes. If you take a look here over on the left-hand side, back in January and February of 21, if you were trading, that was one of the most euphoric markets I've personally ever traded. Of course, it was even wilder in some ways back in the dot-com bubble, but realistically, you can see how wild call volume ended up being. We're at a peak point. We're certainly at a big key zone, and we'll go through it later on. Sentiment systems are also showing that there should be a pullback or sell somewhere around here, which we're seeing a lot in this data. But until price action really goes through some key levels, we won't have a strong sell just yet. At the moment, you've got to be very, very well protected. So we're back in the sell territory that tends to usually bring with it the market sells. And you can see here we had a sell read, small pullback in the market, sell read, small pullback in the market, sell read generally sells off. And then, of course, we had some buy reads, which led on to these big rallies. So this is a combination of different sentiment reports. And it's just showing you that, again, euphoria is in this market right now, which I think we all know. This isn't updated since the FOMC meeting minutes were released. But all that really has happened here is it's kind of done this which puts us closer to, of course, October's concerns, yet the market does not care. In fact, I loaded up a few news pages today and not one article on those news pages was discussing anything about yield curving, which means it's in plain sight, but no one chooses to care about it right now. Now, that's when you should care about things. And as we've already shown on the show several times, there are opportunities in so many markets right now. Yes, you could be following NVIDIA and getting wild, or, of course, you could be looking at the Chinese stocks that we've been looking at, which we'll go up cover later on, and so many other markets, copper and so many other things. Let's talk about single stock options. Again, getting into those peaks, everyone's getting excited, including hedge funds, and the euphoria is across the board, which we've seen plenty of times. But what I think is most interesting here has got to do with the CTAs. For the first time in a while, we've seen CTAs drop across two of the major markets. So we know that things like BNP have been putting out a lot of these estimates, which basically say the market can either climb a little bit or it basically drops in two of the three scenarios. And then we find that over the last kind of 48 hours, both S&P 500 CTAs and of course now updated here NASDAQ CTAs have been dropping their positions a little bit. Now, NVIDIA has helped to rally the markets back up. But if you actually look at the underlying, there's a lot of weakness that's starting to appear. And it is showing that we might be at a peaking point for markets leading into that seasonal period. I thought this was really interesting. We've, of course, seen Jeff Bezos selling positions like hand over fist, 1 billion, 1 billion, 1 billion, and the stock's lapping it up and everyone's buying it. And a lot of this is anticipation of, of course, Amazon going into the Dow. So I thought we would find some information on this. And just so happens that Jason has found some information on this and he's tracked performance of stocks going into the Dow Jones and then what happens afterwards. And I think the results might surprise you. Buy the rumor and generally sell the fact. So is Bezos smart? Is this actually the best choice? Well, I think there's another interesting factor here. Of course, what got kicked out? The stock WBA, which is getting caned at this stage. Now, what was interesting here is getting booted out of the Dow led to mixed outcomes, but a lot of the time you were seeing at least a slightly base or positive outcomes. These are some notable ones that were really good. And of course, these were some ones that were absolutely terrible. So will Amazon actually go up coming into the Dow? Well, it suggests that maybe it's in for a bit of a sideways market for a while as it wasn't so positive. Maybe Walgreens is actually starting to bottom here. So let's now take a look at SKU, another read on SKU. And of course, we mentioned the SKU crush last week. Big deal here because take a look on this side here. According to Nomura, we've seen options SKU in US tech collapsing 
Nobody is fearful from any downside action and downside hedges remain attractive potentially from a volatility point of view. So even with this movement recently, the VIX still hasn't been able to get above 16 and obviously Volmageddon or any kind of vol skew has not really come through just yet. Still cheap to buy puts technically in the markets at this stage. This is another report that we'll probably get rid of after today's video, but it just shows you here when we had that big downside breadth and then we were within highs, again, not too many data points, but it generally showed that you wouldn't necessarily have to be too FOMO-ish about the main index. Instead, you'd probably be more towards single stocks and looking at the different opportunities. So what are the good cases at the moment? Well, last year we reported on this Brett thrust and we obviously loved it very much. And it happened at the beginning of November and we were already suggesting that we might have seen a bottom in October on the show. That so far has been absolutely everything that you would expect. 93.3% of the time, markets are bullish after these thrusts and it looks like that's what's going to happen. So of course, we're well on our way at this stage towards a bumper Zweig thrust and this is the bull case. It doesn't mean you can't have a pullback though. So of course, this is how we're tracking at this stage when it comes to election years. We do have a sitting president running at this stage and of course, you can see that theoretically, if markets are going to sell, it tends to happen around this time of year with a pretty good rally coming out of March. Corrections or correlations to the S&P 500 1929. I keep putting it in here. Just remember, it's a big, scary chart that doesn't mean too much. But still, it's correlated 0.94, which I thought was interesting when I checked it out. Pace of rate cuts. This will be one that you still want to take a picture of and make sure you've got it in the future. If we get a slow cycle, cyclical cut from the Fed later on this year, whenever that may be, whether it's June, like UBS believes, or whether it's later on, like maybe it could be at this stage, then we want to see a slow cycle cut, not a fast cycle. If you get a fast cycle cut, something's broken, they're panicking. And of course, that brings us usually to a bad time in the markets, which if you're a bear, will be pretty good. S&P 500 levels and earnings per share. Now, here's one I posted over on our X account, and it's from Goldman Sachs. And obviously, they're updating their 2024-25 targets. Their 25 target or 24 target is now 5,200. We're currently trading a little bit lower than this, about 5,020, 5,010. And of course, the expectation by the end of the year is 5,200. So it doesn't leave that much upside if you believe this number. Also, earnings per share have been updated from 241 EPS to 237. Oh, I mean 237 to 241. What am I talking about there? 2024. And 2025 EPS is from 250 to 256. So basically, we're getting upgrades from Goldman. We're getting upgrades from a lot of these big bankers saying that everything's all good and everything's all fine. And you can see why. Global stress indexes across the world are returning back to very, very good periods. In fact, they're at periods where everyone says everything's all good and it goes on for a little while. Now, you could say this is a contrarian indicator, but certainly it looks like financial stress index has completely gone away. Now, we've mentioned that there's opportunity and there's abundance mindset, which we go into a lot on this channel. And a lot of you tell me that helps you because the idea or the worst two things you can fear it, or have in markets is fear or greed. And if you ever have those feelings, you're probably better off not trading or even investing. Now, the reason why we want to be objective about things is, of course, we saw the Russell 2K start to struggle the other day. And what this tends to do is it tends to lead into a little bit of a sideways action period for the markets, but actually a bottoming effect. And I think I want to get into the idea that it is a bottoming effect. This is where we have a 4% down day that was reversed in two sessions, and then we kind of hover around, if not drop a little bit. But we tend to see a bottom in the markets. Now, as many of you would know, we actually have had one of the worst reports for the Russell in recent years, a 50% discount to the SPY in terms of overall performance, and it's trading at like 20% under all-time highs. So the Russell has been very bad, and a lot of it will come back to yield discussion. Of course, the S&P 500 not caring about yields right now, as we already talked about in today's video, but the Russell 2K, maybe that does care because it's trading in line with the yields at this stage and suffering for it. If we see yields go down, if we obviously see the Fed cutting, could be a good sign that the Russell is moving up. Of course, the 5K number is still important. We're trading around that. We've already talked this one to death, so go check out one of our other videos if you're interested. 
Now, as I mentioned before, the VIX is super important. A 15.50-16 break, in particular 15, 16 plus close, was going to be very big over the last 24 hours. Did it happen? No. And why is it important? Because it was probably going to mean that we'd go through the 20-day moving average on the S&P 500 and that we would also see the potential of some Volmageddon opening up. Realistically, a squeeze on short vol that's been happening in quite some time. But don't worry, there's plenty of opportunity everywhere. So even if the VIX doesn't go above 16 and then you go and buy individual stocks, that'll be okay because we are seeing other markets starting to ramp as well. China's bounce, we talked about the thrust. We've obviously talked about the capitulation. We've talked about the stats of how it usually does find a bit of strength. And it certainly has done so over the last 24 hours with a nice move across both the Hang Seng, the CQQ, KWeb, and all those other codes. And that tends to happen in the Lunar New Year which is, of course, what we're facing at this point. We're in the, basically almost at the end of that particular session. So let's talk about Chinese stocks when it comes to replacing their main regulator. We know that's also another positive. I saw over the last 24 hours that the government's coming in and trying to excite private equity. We've had uh, launches of defined outcome funds, and all of these are usually signs of a bottoming market where everything's horrible, but we're getting main regulators and basically government support. Now, Plugging a ship is not a good long-term strategy, but let's face it, there's plenty of markets out there that have been plugging with central bank money for quite some time. Let's now go through the big earnings coming up. We still have more. Moderna, Block, Carvana, so many big Intuit, all of these big stocks still coming through. And do remember, people like Block, Square, as it was used to be known, and Moderna are still expected to be a plus minus 11 and plus minus 10% move on the session. When we go over unusual trade block activity, as we've mentioned, all of this SPY level is very heavily traded. So I don't know if it's shorts or what's going on here. I would say it's some take profits, but this is a massive trade level. Another huge trade that's come through recently has been SQQ, a big one coming in the last 24 hours before NVIDIA. It may have been a bit of a guess or a hedge on NVIDIA's earnings report, but SQQ getting a big dark pool transaction out of nowhere over the last 24 hours. And again, it was before the NVIDIA report. Speaking of NVIDIA, 1.26 times volume with 938,000 on the call side. Pan, or Palo Alto Pan W, you can see here down 28.4%. That is very bad for that stock. And while it might find what we call elastic demand and pick back up, it, it was struggling through the session. And there were a lot of stocks not doing so well. You can see here, one of my favorites, CrowdStrike down 9.7 on the session. It has had a big run on it. Adobe suffering a little bit. Super Micro obviously still floundering around on these lows. But really, it comes back to what are the retail traders doing? And predominantly, it wasn't a huge options day. I expect the next day being Thursday to be a bigger day. 55% calls and 30% of retail traders trading single legs. So still a lot of activity still on the call side at this stage. Let's now jump into the charts. First up, skew crush. That's a big skew crush. Generally synonymous with the pre-early signs of market weakness. Uh, this is something I do not ignore. And I think a lot of people aren't talking about it, which is kind of good. So skew crush, definitely on the side of the bears at this point. But let's put it all together. What about central bank liquidity? Remember before we had down on the balance sheet, down on liquidity in some ways with the reverse repos? While it still has remained relatively flat, I wouldn't say it's supportive of the next of the last run, nor would I say it's negative. So at this point, we would call it neutral, though there was a little drop over the last 24 hours that came into the central bank liquidity, both worldwide and the Fed. When we go to yields, you can see that yields have found themselves to be at a pretty stable level, and 4.7% keeps getting tapped on the two-year and we can see here that this is a very important level. A breach above this will really expose a breakout of yields and probably will bring the bears back into the market. But I would like to remind everybody, we are at a 50% pullback to where we were from October to the 11th of Jan. So really, since the 11th of Jan, nothing much has gotten better for the markets in terms of rate cuts, but earnings have met expectations in particular for the MAG6, which we know is running this market at this stage. What about bonds? Well, they're not really freaking out. High yield junk bonds, not dropping that much. Our bond indicator, which we put on the charts last time, not really dropping at all. In fact, it's holding its own. So again, bonds aren't freaking out. They might be trading a little bit more in line with what's going on in the markets, as in they've been sideways for most of this year because they're trading in line with the two changes. 
But what they haven't been doing is dropping like a rock. If bonds were doing that, I'd be incredibly concerned about markets right now. Copper getting close to some big take profit targets, obviously hitting 390. That's a big zone. I've been very bullish on copper over the last week. It's been going really nicely. And I still think copper might break a 395 to 4. So watch out for the copper because it's coming on these charts. Dollar index held itself. The euro with an excellent trade on it soon, depending on what happens here. 20 day moving average, a huge level. I'm looking forward to reporting back on the dollar very, very soon. But for now, it's holding. And technically, this is where the bulls would be on this chart. Let's now go over to a couple of other things that are linked to that. Of course, we talked about oil. And we're looking for oil to 82.50 to 84.50 a barrel. Now, it did bounce off the 20. It bounced off the demand zone. That's good for oil traders. But we really need an 80 plus. Once we get 80 plus, 80 to 82.50 seems much more of a plausible scenario. Unfortunately, the problem with this 79.80 area is we've seen it be just a weak high. So it's not quite through that zone, but it does have some positive weekly signs and daily signs at the moment. So I guess oil looking towards the bull side more than anything else. Then it comes to gold trading around the most traded zone. Now for a lot of day traders, they're gonna be looking at this and they're gonna say, well, I think we should look at shorts on gold right here. And if the dollar does go bullish, that would be probably the better course of action. But it's a very important level. It did break through, of course, this little two hour 20 moving average. It's rallied back up from that point. And right where it is at the time of this recording, if bears are going to take control, you would think they're going to do it around this point. Let's talk about Tesla still holding its own. Obviously, 200, a huge inflection point for Tesla. Big core wall there. 195, we talked about that being a very important put wall. And for this week and the expiration, and it continues to hold around that zone. So 200 breakout, very strong. At the moment, I'd probably side with the bull end unless the market just completely gets dumped. And that's based on an inverse head and shoulders, a breach out, and obviously holding itself above that 195. Let's now take a look at the MAG7, although we probably shouldn't have Tesla in here anymore. And after hours, it'll be up. So we're probably trading about 2,300. But I just want to note here that it's back to that daily 20, just like all the other markets are, and it made a lower high. So obviously it's not as strong as maybe some people would expect. Now we get a new high on this one. This is just gonna be a pullback in time, get ready for the short squeeze. So one to watch the codes on your screen if you're interested in putting it into your charts. It's not quite a perfect proxy, but it's certainly one you could look at. Nvidia held the 20, obviously 674. If it did a bad earnings announcement, I would have expected it straight into 600, 610. And because of the good earnings announcement, it went back up to the 720, 750 zone. A breach above 750 will be a big deal because if it can get through there and close, that's going to really expose further short squeezes and I'm sure there's going to be some upgrades coming. Get ready for 1K upgrades for the stock. Get ready for 1.2K upgrades for the stock. It doesn't mean it's a great buy, but I'm sure there's some big upgrades coming from economists across the world. SMCI, what's going on here? Big dump, so far so good. This will get a bounce from NVIDIA, you would think. And we're kind of hoping it does. I'm kind of feeling like it could do something like this where it bounces up, getting that BTFD in it, and then it maybe starts to weaken off, possibly even making new lows over the next three to six months. I'm not positive on this stock to make a new high though. That was a massive sell-off, just like Pan W was as well over the last 24 hours. So for good news, what's going good in the markets at the moment? Well, the Chinese stocks did have a pretty good session. And you can see here the HSI getting through, not quite closing above the 16,500, which is the big zone. Broken through trend lines, obviously improved price action, which we've been rabbiting on about on this show. And we can also see here that CQQ held up with a 1.37% and something like, uh, I guess, KWeb, which is another uh, fairly popular ETF also holding at a 1.68. It was up more at one point, but certainly breakouts across the board on a lot of Chinese stocks in recent weeks. Let's move over now to the US market. And we still face ourselves at a bit of a important point here, an inflection point for these markets. Qs, they did go under the 20 moving average on the gap, but they ended up green. So I wouldn't class that as necessarily a sell through the 20. And the reason is because it didn't close with a red candle. It actually ended up as a bullish hammer. So for now, because of NVIDIA, the markets did rally through and they've held that 20. They're still at an extreme zone. They're still at what we call like a TD8, TD9 on a lot of the different fractal timeframes. 
The US 500 is holding its own at the 75 Fib at the last retracement. Now, I've written in here most traded zone, which is about 50-20. And around this level, sorry, 50-10. And around this level is what I expect to be one of the last levels for bears. If the markets push through a new high and don't instantly reject it, we're probably going on more short squeezing. And that short squeezing, you would think, will lead us into 5200, 5150, those kind of levels, getting close to Goldman Sachs' overall yearly target. I'm not necessarily convinced of that just yet. I do think that this is still a very important zone between bulls and bears. And Nvidia certainly did hold up the market. So it's changed sentiment, but is it enough? Very important level, one to watch. And it was all about really a rally after it broke through this point, which I mentioned in our Market Masters Club, a huge level when it broke through that zone. Links in the description if you ever end up joining or interested in that type of thing. Let's talk about the S&P and from the market perspective here, you can see daily 20 moving average, how many times it's held. And of course, the futures have often tapped these levels. So until it's underneath that, you know, there's not going to be any real major bears in this market. US 2K holding itself as well as it can. You can see here it's still a little bit weaker and it's just in the middle of nowhere land. So still bullish, still higher highs and higher lows. No changes here on the US 2K to our discussion points. Now I want to move over to Bitcoin though because it does seem to be starting to struggle a little bit and Bitcoin could be in what we call a Wyckoff. So is this some type of preliminary kind of rally? Then we get a... a I guess you would say our buying climax, and then we've got a UT or a UTAD over here. Well, it certainly was just barely a new high, and then it went straight back down and tested this low. So this is a very important point. Is it accumulation for a new bullish high, or is it distribution? I think we'll find it very, very soon. And so far, it's suggesting it's probably distribution. Remember, we've talked about 51K being a resistance. It went a little bit higher. Obviously, I think anywhere around here, the market needs to have a chill pill because Bitcoin is doing better than it ever has done into any of the halving cycles that I've seen over the years. This is a very good run up into the halving cycles and I wouldn't be surprised at all to see some weakness after the Chinese New Year here. In terms of information moving forward, we still have unemployment claims and a little bit of PMI data. So that's some stuff to watch. And as a reminder as well, if you enjoyed today's show, please remember to subscribe, smash that like button and the alert button, and obviously check out our free VIP weekly newsletter opening up some new accounts down there. So all you need to do is you just go down, put in your email address and name, and of course we send it out to you each and every week. Thank you so much for being a member, guys. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.